Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, which we all know is the very best live broadcast here on YouTube. What is Getting Sketchy, you ask? Well, it is a live show, obviously, where either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher Ashley Hurst tries to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes with a little bit of art instruction sprinkled in. And uh, tonight we're going to be continuing on with our season. This is going to be the last drawing episode of this season. And next week we'll do a recap and take a look at the 10 drawings that Ashley and I have created. Speaking of Ashley, he's sitting right over there. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, Matt. Thanks for asking. And I hope you guys are all doing well out there also from Canada, Australia, all over the United States. I hope you guys are hungry because Matt's going to draw something great for us to eat tonight. Yeah, some people are going to argue whether or not it's delicious or not. Um, <laughs> but some of, uh, some of you will definitely find it to be delicious, of course. And uh, I'm sure we're going to give some shout outs to everybody in the chat box once things get rolling. But we are live and there is a chat box. So you can, of course, make comments and ask questions during tonight's broadcast. They don't have to be anything art related. It, they don't have to be art related. They need to be art related. Should be art related, be probably. Art related. Art related. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. I didn't. I didn't mean to say they should not. It doesn't be have art to related. relate directly to your drawing, <laughs> right? Just, but we can talk about any subject art related, or at least uh, at least try to. And that's what I was trying to say. Um, <laughs> you can ask questions or make comments, and they don't have to be about what we're doing tonight. It can be anything that's art related, of course. But if you put those comments and questions in all capital letters, that'll help Ashley see it amongst all the other comments and questions because the chat box gets rolling pretty quickly from time to time, especially here on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're brand new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell so you're notified when we upload new videos and when we go live here with Getting Sketchy. And if you like this video, make sure that you like it, of course. And I should also remind you that we have a fantastic membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com which includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subjects and media. We also do weekly live lessons, which after tonight's broadcast, we're going to head over to thevirtualinstructor.com. I'm going to be continuing with our live lesson series where we're working with pastels and doing a landscape. And we also have weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers. So there's a ton of stuff to explore in our membership program. There's a link in the description below. Everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free, so you can go in and check out the program and see if it's right for you. If you want to just get your feet wet a little bit and check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free, you can do that as well. There's a link in the description below this video, and you can check that at you can check that out as well. I'm gonna work on my talking tonight. I'm, I'm yeah, my... I think you need to stop talking and start drawing what you do best. <laughs> Well, that makes it harder because then I have to talk and draw at the same time. So mm -hmm. if I'm having trouble with my words right now, there's no telling what's going to happen here in just a minute. So uh, <laughs> let's let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and switch over to the main camera and get into this one. All right. All right. Uh, here's a look at our photo reference up here in the upper left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should be no surprise here that this is sushi. And uh, I know that there's people that love sushi and there's people that don't like sushi or don't love sushi. Um, this is real sushi though, because it just looks like there's raw salmon in there. Or maybe that's tuna, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's fish. It's, it's kind of fish. I feel good about that, saying um, that. I usually stick with the California rolls, the shrimp tempura rolls, you know, the stuff that's cooked. Um, spider rolls, I like those. Spider rolls, yeah, mm -hmm. all that stuff's cooked. Anyway, this is what we're gonna be working with tonight. And we're only going to do three of the sushi rolls because, uh, or the sushi pieces, uh, because three is actually a better number than four. Uh, for whatever reason, odd numbers seem to be more aesthetically successful. Florists do this. Uh, they will, when they're making a floral arrangement, they'll use an odd number of flowers when they add it to the arrangement. Um, and when we have uh, a composition like this, it's always usually better to have an odd number because if you have an even number sometimes that can uh, it, it can make it a guessing game as to which object is the focal point or which object is most important mm, that's a good point um, so three is what we're going to be doing tonight and i'm going to be using a variety of different materials here we're going to start off with just a graphite pencil i'm going to be using a 2h graphite pencil to sketch things out initially i'm working on hot press watercolor paper 
This is 140 pound paper by Canson. Hot press paper is smooth, unlike cold press watercolor paper. So whenever I'm doing a line and wash kind of image, mm -hmm. I typically like to work on the hot press paper, not always, but the hot press paper really accentuates the line that you are making. Uh, so we're gonna be using line obviously, cause we're gonna be using some uh, pen and ink application. So we're gonna sketch things out real lightly and loosely with a graphite pencil first. Then we're gonna start working on our lines here. And I have uh, several different size uh, pens here. This is a 0.1, a 0.3, and a 0.7. And all of these are Stiedler uh, pens here. Uh, of course, you can use any pen that you wish, just as long as it's waterproof, because we're gonna be applying a bit of watercolor markers over the top here. Uh, now you can substitute this with traditional watercolor. I'm using watercolor markers basically just to save time. I did a video on this not too long ago. This is actually gonna be the second time I've ever used watercolor markers. Typically I would just prefer to use watercolor uh, right from um, the, the cake or right from the tube, not necessarily right from the tube, but <laughs> working from a palette. Um, but I'm gonna be using these watercolor markers tonight to uh, keep things moving pretty quickly. The colors I'm gonna be using are cadmium red hue, cadmium yellow hue, uh, Prussian blue hue, as you can see, these are all uh, hues, um, sap green, not a hue, <laughs> and uh, ivory black here. So, um, but that's gonna be later on in the process. And I also have a couple of nylon brushes here. These are Grumbacher Golden Edge uh, brushes. And these are my favorite brushes when I'm working with a water-based medium uh, like watercolor. These brushes, even though they're synthetic, they keep a nice sharp tip, but they're nice and soft. Uh, exactly what you want in most circumstances when you're trying to create a controlled watercolor painting. So, all right. And a needed eraser. Do a little bit of erasing as well. Are there any questions All right. or anything? Yeah. Well, we need to um, one we Southpaw this? two mentions that the colors in the reference image look great, and that's true because they are pretty much complementary colors. So that green or yellow green and red are playing against one another and uh, just adding some intensity uh, to to Matt's subject. So, and I, you know, I noticed in your original reference, the sushi really makes it to the very edges of the picture plane. Also, creates a little bit of tension around the edge. So. Um, I think squeezing it down to three probably is good compositionally anyway. So all, all good all good composition choices there. There's also a repetition of shape, mm -hmm. which is going to contribute to overall unity for your artwork. So um, a lot of positives happen in here in your reference before you even start. And uh, we should point out too, you know, you mentioned complementary color scheme. Complementary means that the colors are directly across from each other on the color wheel. So you could say red and green in a general sense, but if we look closer, we could almost push the greens to more of a, a the lettuce anyway. It looks like mm -hmm. lettuce in there. I don't know if that's lettuce <laughs> or not. Uh, looks like lettuce, doesn't it? I don't think I've ever had sushi with lettuce in it before. But I, I don't know exactly what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's green and yellow. There are two green, green things in right, there. Right, there's two, two, one's more two green than the other. So there is a little variety. Is maybe cucumber. I don't know. Maybe. I'm sure you people out there know what what we're looking at. Anyway, one <laughs> is a little bit. We could push it blue green. The other we could, we could push That's yellow true. green. That's true. Yeah, you could. Then we could have the sushi, the meat, be uh, red, and then that's a split complementary mm -hmm. color scheme. On the opposite of that, we could say that the sushi itself is a little bit more red-orange. You could go that direction. And, well, I don't think we could go that direction because the well, uh, red-orange, the other two colors would start, be... You would need to go with blue, more blue-green. Yeah, you'd have to, to, be to really maintain that complementary relationship. Strike that. that, that strike like, that. The, like the Miami Dolphins, <laughs> red-orange and blue-green. Yeah, the Miami, Miami Dolphins yeah, are... Strange uh, complementary cool relationship there. You know, the NFL team that I think has the best... Color scheme. What do you think it is? What's your oh NFL my gosh. team that oh you my gosh. feel like has the best? Oh, has the coolest, the coolest color scheme for their jerseys? Probably the. Uh, gosh, maybe He's the Falcons. I'm thinking this. about the, probably the Atlanta Falcons. Maybe the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, some of their jerseys look great. Red and black. You red and black is uh, the Falcons. I like mm. uh, the Seattle well, look, Seahawks. Look, look, look at my jacket. Yeah, you're red and red. I'm wearing, wearing red, red and black, black now. So I like the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, uh, they've got that yellow green, the yeah. blue green. I like their that dark blue. and their logo. I think is based on like traditional Tlingit artwork. Huh. I think. So I'm not sure. It reminds me of Tlingit artwork. It's a, it's a group of people from from Canada. So and you know it's it's um, 
some of their some of their designs over the years have been been pretty nice and pretty nice. So, okay, so I will agree they have nicely designed uniforms, even if they're you know analogous colors. Yeah, it's analogous. It is. Yeah. They're analogous um, color scheme. All right, Chris says salmon, avocado, and cucumber. Um, and other people are putting in there. Oh, Cynthia said Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You're right all on right. the page with me. <laughs> Randy Taylor said the Panthers. The Panthers is my, are, are my favorite team. I, I should put a bag over my head for saying that. But um, <laughs> the Seattle Seahawks definitely have the coolest outfits. Definitely. All right. Uh, Priya Shah 007 says, OMG, look at the tip of that pencil. Oh, yeah. And so it, good. So sharp. Yeah, yeah that's and, how to do um, it. I, I recently published a video on YouTube on how to sharpen your pencils like a pro. So, <laughs> so watch that and uh, don't cut yourself. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and um, get ready to get started here. I'm going to bring up the timer and then I'll go ahead and get started here. So there we go. 45 minutes. And I'm going to try to fit all of these rolls in this little area right here. I'm, I'm okay. sure they're like pieces and not rolls, so forgive me for calling them rolls. Um, I don't want to, you know, m m make the sushi aficionados upset. Mm -mm. And I'm starting with a light uh, drawing here. I, I could put a little bit more pressure on the pencil, but I'm going to have to erase these lines in a minute. Are you using an HB pencil right now? I'm using now? a 2H pencil. Okay. Oh, yeah. Pretty light. So it's pretty light. And typically, this pencil is a little bit darker on watercolor paper for whatever reason. I haven't really figured that one out. But uh, And I'm trying to make these big enough where I can get some um, variety in the color, but also... Not so large that I'm not going to be able to finish this in the allotted time. So I'm going to mm -hmm. try to draw pretty quickly here. And these sushi rolls are not perfectly round. So I kind of want to accentuate their unperfectness. Their irregularity. Their, their irregularity. So I'm not drawing circles here. I'm just kind of thinking about angles. I like how you're seeing the straighter segments of these, uh, you know, roundish objects. Seeing the, that's how I like to draw sometimes on with rounder objects. Try to draw with straighter lines first. And this guy needs to be behind the first guy, so we can't let this dip down below. Mm -hmm. Can't get too low on the page with that one. Yeah, so the consensus seems to be that there's avocado in these sushi rolls and maybe some, some bok choy. Oh, some bok choy, yeah. See, I don't even think about those things. But the avocado, definitely think about those. Mm -hmm. I love, love avocado. avocado. Yeah, me too. Some days for lunch, all I'll have are these things called egg bites. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of egg bites before? I'm sure there's people out there that have heard of egg bites. I get them at Costco. Yeah, I've seen them there. And they're delicious. They're really good. Mm -hmm. I think you showed them to me, actually, in your oh, kitchen yeah. a few weeks ago. <laughs> Love the egg bites. I mean, you just take them out, 90 seconds in the microwave, boom. Mm -hmm. You got some delicious eggy-type things. Now, <laughs> one thing I'll point out about these pieces is because of the way they're positioned, we can see the side of the first two, but we can't, we can see the side here and we can see a little bit of the side on the second one, but we can't see the side on the third one. Yeah. Uh, but we can see a little bit of cast shadow underneath there and that's gonna kind of tie all of these together here. And since the light source is originating from, uh, well, it looks like it's originating from the upper left. I'm gonna extend this shadow out on this last sushi piece a little bit further even though that's not necessarily happening in the reference. All right, now let's go back in and look at some of these bigger shapes that exist. And look, I'm, I'm not going to get too wrapped up in making this perfect, but I am going to start thinking about these shapes on the inside and kind of segment it down. Oh, I do see the avocado on this, this one here. Daily Portland says, I would have started with a drawing box. I think probably like a picture plane, like a... Uh, like a some sort of a rectangle to work inside of, but you're, just, you're working in your sketchbook. Is that right? Oh, no, you're working on loose pa a loose paper. Who, me? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, this is loose paper. Do you plan to put a picture plane around your sushi um, near the end? I kind of did off 
camera oh, okay. just to make sure I don't go outside of the boundaries. Okay, I got you. But no, I'm not really trying to frame this in in a picture plane. All right. That that would be helpful if I had if I had a more difficult arrangement of objects to draw initially. I see. Or, or parts of it went off the picture plane, then I would definitely draw a picture plane to begin with. But in this particular case, I'm just trying to keep it in in the picture plane just for you. inside of the just, inside of the window on our screen just for you viewers okay. yes so that's our picture plane that's, your entire screen <laughs> that's your picture plane <laughs> so we priya wonders these. if your egg bites are like egg muffins like egg muffins no that's more that would be more food than i get in the egg bites <laughs> um the egg bites are there it's like it's like an egg souffle or something. It's got some vegetables in it and stuff. But I'm telling you what, 90 seconds in the microwave, you're eating some good gourmet eggs. It's kind of an eggy type food here. I'm just putting some simple shapes in here. Not going to worry about the rice on the outside. I'm going to show you how we're going to handle that when we get to the pen and ink. But for right now, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, maybe I'll put a few of these little visible lines in here in the meat. Now, again, this is a sketch, so I'm going really quick. If I was drawing this to be a finished image, uh, I, of course, I would work a little bit slower. So I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that art is something that's done very quick. Um, you know, if you're wanting to create a more finished piece, then expect to spend some time on it. Take some time. Take your time. Now let's move on to the next one. I swear that's lettuce in there. That's got to be lettuce. Little tiny pieces of lettuce. Yeah, that's what it's it looks folded like. folded up. <clears throat> Buddy reminds everybody in the chat, if you put your questions in capital, they'll be able to read it um, and read your question more easily. That's true. A lot of times the uh, lowercase letters, I assume, might be conversations between you folks. So if you'd like your question read, make sure you put it in caps. And also, um, if you have any questions about uh, virtual instructor membership or anything pertaining to such, uh, the best thing to do is to put that in an email and send that to the virtual instructor and you'll get a response. Yeah, we have a contact form on the site. So that's the best uh, way to go about that. I assume somebody might be asking something about their account, account or something. Oh, uh, yeah, or just yeah. membership questions in general. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the best forum um, to get those questions answered. All right. So, again, general large shapes here don't have to be exact, don't have to be perfect. This is going to be a stylized image. Uh, if you're wondering, we're not going for realism here. Uh, that should be uh, pretty clear, noting the materials we're using here. So, mm -hmm. um, if you wanted a more realistic look, you'd probably want to use mediums that allowed you a little bit more control over the gradation of value. Uh, pen and ink is it's more of a rigid uh, material, obviously, and especially when, when we're going to combine it with watercolor markers. Mm. And only a few markers. I only have five colors here designated. And if you don't count black, then only have four colors. We're going to try to create as much range as we possibly can in those colors here, too. All right, Roberto asks, why did you choose to draw only three? And uh, Matt did mention a little bit, talked a little bit about that at the very top of the hour. Um, a lot of, well, I guess, is that right? The top of the hour, the bottom, the middle of the hour, maybe? At the beginning of the broadcast. The beginning of the broadcast, let's say that. And um, Matt is of the opinion, and I am too, that groupings of odd numbers just kind of read better in an artwork. Sometimes our brain tries to really organize even numbers, um, threes and, and sixes, but uh, groups of three and five seem to, seem to work a little better. It helps our eyes to move from one object to another. And Matt pointed out that um, in groupings of, of even numbers, sometimes it's difficult to tell if there's a focal point or if one is more important. You know, none of the sushi can be in the middle if there are four. And so that was some of his, his rationale in choosing to draw just three. When we put together still lives in my own art classes, I usually suggest for my own students um, to do threes and fives. And I'm, 
you know, I am a, totally aware that I did an entire series here on the on the <laughs> <laughs> on the show yeah. last season with pairs or groupings of two objects, and that was one of my challenges. I was trying to kind of work against one of those um, sort of standard rules that we often follow when we do set up still life. So it's totally okay to break the rules. Don't think I'm saying that groups of two or four can't be done. Um, sure, they can be done. Um, but sometimes we have to work a little bit harder to make them interesting. Okay, I'm going to use a uh, point seven marker. I actually pulled out a pen. I actually pulled out a point five. Actually, I'm going to use the point five. I'm testing this off camera, and it's the point seven is a little bit dried up here. Um, just making sure I got the right cap on the right pen, and I'm losing time. All right, so I'm going to start with a thick mark or thick pen here, and then I'm going to go in and just initially. I'm just going to trace over the contour lines, the outer contour lines of each sushi piece in each section within the sushi piece. So I'll start with the delicious seaweed outer shell here. And this second time that you're hitting your contour lines is a chance to refine them a little bit too. So um, Alana pointed out that uh, she started before you and you passed her. Matt did draw those pencil lines pretty fast, um, but he also has a chance to, to look at them and judge them again as he works with the pen. Now, these lines might seem really thick, but they're not going to be thick enough. We're going to have to go back over them towards the end of the process, uh, and I'm going to try to restrain myself from doing that right now. Mm -hmm. They might seem overly bold right now, but just be patient. So now I'm going to go in and just outline some of these sections here. So I'm going to think we got the lettuce section here. And then we've got the bok choy or whatever that is. Maybe avocado piece. No, the avocado's down there at the bottom. You know, I'm a pretty Cucumber. meat and potatoes kind of guy. I ate um, meatloaf and mashed potatoes for dinner just tonight. So I didn't, I didn't eat a lot of sushi growing up. I wasn't really exposed to it that much. Um, but my wife did, and so I've learned to eat more sushi, and my daughter craves it. She just loves sushi. Yeah, I didn't really eat sushi until I met my wife. Mm. Um, and... She exposed it to me. Similar experience. Yeah, but um, I don't know. I'm glad you had meatloaf tonight. <laughs> you, know, you know what I had for dinner. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I had. We should have drawn I had a protein bar. For we dinner. should have drawn your protein bar tonight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sometimes things are. My life is just too busy to eat, and of course it's super crazy and hectic on Wednesday with the. Uh, with the two broadcast, I also filmed the Members Minute on Wednesday. And uh, that makes for a pretty hectic day around my life anyway. And let's see. So, again, I'm just outlining the outer part, the outer contour, and then the contours of each little section on the inside. So we're going to strive to have a little bit of line quality or variety in the line. Mm -hmm. This is going to contribute to the stylized appearance of the finished drawing. Trying to make the bottom of these sushi pieces a little bit flatter. Give them a little bit of a sense of weight. Yeah, that's nice. I can, I can see that. And I'm following my photo reference, but not. I'm not getting obsessed with anything. So uh, it, I'm getting the general idea of the sushi. I'm not trying to copy it exactly. All right, I'm going to switch over now to the point zero 0.03, and we're going to start over here um, by just putting some hatching on the outer part of 
the sushi piece. This is where we've got clearly the, uh, the seaweed there, and it's a little bit reflective. Mm -hmm. So there's some areas that are a little bit lighter. So as I'm working up the side here where some light is hitting, I'm going to leave some open spaces. Yeah, I see those broken lines in there. Again, doesn't have to be perfect, just needs a little bit of variety here. And this is kind of like, it's cross-contour shading, I guess. You chose the short direction instead of the longer direction. Yeah, you could have gone the other way if you wanted to. The other way meaning up and around. Right. And you can do cross-hatching. I'm only going to use hatching for this image. I think hatching looks a little cleaner, especially mm -hmm. when you're going to be accentuating things or uh, making the the drawing a little bit more interesting with some color washes. Uh, cross hatching is fun, but sometimes cross hatching can get a little busy if you are adding color. Okay, that's a good piece of advice. Peter Valcana says, Panthers question mark, Patriots all the way. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> you, do you know how much, how many nightmares I have of that Super Bowl? I was uh, looking forward Panthers... to reading that comment. I know you wouldn't like it. <laughs> And then Tom Brady just won't go away. He's now in the Panthers division. He's going to play you know, until he's 50. Yeah. That's... All right, so I'm putting some of that hatching down here in the cast shadow, too, if, if you miss that here. All right, Daily Portland says, I was taught not to draw over graphite with these pens, that it could ruin them, question um, mark? If I ruin one of these pens, I'll go out and buy another one. I mean, it's yeah. like $2. Right, it's worth it. I have no idea who would ever tell you that. <laughs> that that makes no sense. Maybe to me. if you had a lar like a really an an area that was totally colored in or shaded in with a heavy graphite, I could see that getting up into the filament maybe a little bit and clogging it up. But those very light pencil lines that Matt drew, uh, probably not enough to make a difference. It doesn't look like they're making a difference. His pens are seem to be working okay. Okay, so now I'm going to give an indication of some of these little. Pieces, and they're just a repetition of some squares and rectangles. So, again, not going to get too carried away with making it exactly the way I see it. Now, um, this comment may have been written when your hand was in a different position than it is now, but David Ro uh, Robot says, are you angling your hand that way just for the camera? And I'm not sure if that means... Like to, this? Right. It's, it's Yes. Yeah. Because if I was working at like a table or something like, I'm mean, working at a table. If I was working at a place where I could move my entire drawing surface, I would move the entire drawing surface. Right. Sometimes when I'm working in here, I've gotten so used to, to drawing for a camera uh, <laughs> that I don't even think about moving my, my table or anything like that or I moving my I still get a little board. frustrated sometimes. I feel like I need to turn my drawing a little bit and can't. Yeah, it, it takes some getting used to. And even when I'm working in the studio by myself, um, and I'm working on a video, then I will stand up and like contort my body. So that you, the picture right. can, can stay still. Right. right, exactly. So it is a little bit, um, it is a little bit challenging sometimes to draw on a, on a fixed piece of paper. That's true. All right. So for these little lettuce pieces, I'm just trying to just create some overlapping marks that are just a little bit different than what's happening here. Not extremely different, just a little bit different. And then we're going to come back and handle these guys. Well, let's go ahead and do these thicker lines first with the point three, And then we'll come back and do the thinner ones. Ellie points out that um, she's had problems with the point oh three pins in graphite. And those are very, very fine. So um, maybe, maybe the finer the pin and the, and, the, and the softer the graphite getting together creates some problems. But I don't know. Like I've, I've, never, I, um, I've never had any problems covering graphite with with any type of permanent mm -hmm. pen, whether it be uh, one of these Steeler pens or a Micron pen or uh, a, a nib pen or a dip pen. Now, I will tell you that there are some people out there that believe that if you do a pencil sketch to begin with, you are somehow cheating. You are cheating the world or, or something. I don't know how you'd be cheating. Mm-hmm. Or who's going to lose if you if you use <laughs> if you use a graphite drawing underneath? Um, uh, but they just some people feel like that approach to drawing with pen and ink is somehow not the purest way to create a pen and ink drawing. And I, I guess those are the same people 
It's just appreciated. They would challenge. rather walk three miles down the road to the convenience store than to hop in their car and yeah, drive. Yeah, just they enjoy the challenge. So, yeah, there is something to be said about that, and there is a freshness to your marks if you make them without uh, graphite marks. But you can still get the same kind of freshness with your marks, even with a graphite drawing in if place. If you're conscious of it, and you just don't move too slow, and you've been drawing pretty pretty quickly, you know your marks do have a a fresh feel to them because they're not overly labored. Now we we have a we have a philosophical question here. All right. From Demobid D. I hope I said your handle right. Why do some artists revert back to drawing like a child? I don't get it after they've been in art college for four years. And uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Picasso once said something to the effect that it took him his whole life to learn to draw like a child. So he has a, you know, he has a quote that uh, it, it, that iterates the very thing you're talking about. Well, well it, you want to start with that one? Or I guess you? so. Yeah, I'll okay, go ahead. I'll start. go ahead. This is a loaded question. Yeah, we, we could, could talk about this all we night. We can talk about it all night and probably end up on the other side of the issue by the time we get there. And I go back and forth. What we're really talking about with Wait, artists... Before you start that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just want to talk about the rice pieces that I'm going to yeah, draw next. That. We can draw every piece of ice, or every piece of ice, every piece of rice that we see. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify it down into groupings of rice, and I'm going to put these groupings in areas where we see darker value or shadow. So I'm mm. going to start down here at the bottom, and I'm just going to draw a few little shapes that kind of look like rice, or look like little pills, actually. <laughs> That's and what I put in my sushi, little pills. And then I'm just going to let them fade out to one or two. And then I'm just going to put a few indications of this here and there around the sushi. And hopefully it will read as rice. And then when we paint this with the watercolor markers, we'll do a little something else with it to kind of give it that impression that we have a, a texture that repeats without having to draw every little piece of rice. Okay, go. Okay, so yeah, as far as drawing like a drawing like a child, I think what we're a lot of times talking about is one of the is a degree of abstraction, of um, flat of flatter shapes, sh shape oriented artwork with a little less gradation. And in terms of uh, the type of cubism that Picasso did, uh, one of those two versions was called thin synthetic cubism. You know, he moved the features around, or really he was trying to look at a subject from multiple points of view at the same time, and it kind of came out looking like like a child's drawing. So um, the, I guess the reasoning, is, the reasoning is these artists that do so um, appreciate abstraction and that space sort of between, um, you know, design, non-objective design, and representational art. You don't, you know, you don't have to agree with that or necessarily um, like it or enjoy it. Um, the artwork that, I mean, you could argue that Basquiat kind of drew in a childlike way. Um, but in, in addition to that, you know, he also had some strong placement of the imagery in his artwork. So you can have strong composition, strong color relationships. You can have a strong message, artwork with a meaning that's easy to read sometimes in a simplified drawing. So uh, you can make a good piece of art and still not necessarily draw representationally. Um, now, it depends on what, what our personal goals are um, for our artwork. Matt and I pretty much are representational artists. We don't work very abstractly. Uh, maybe a little bit of stylization. That's about as far as the two of us usually go. So it's a, it is philosophical, and I can't really say that um, one's right and wrong, but some people believe or you know have um, bought into the idea that it's simplifying in, in the terms of uh, or that abstracting their art in terms of simplification uh, can make it easier to read and sometimes um, kind of con convey a message beyond what a representational piece of art might say. Well, also I'll add to that that there's an artist named William de Kooning. I'm mm -hmm. not really sure how many of you have heard of de Kooning. But I was his, thinking about woman number one and two. His whole, his whole deal was to try to find a way to draw or paint in the purest form possible. So uh, he... He um, decided that the way to do that was try to, to try to forget everything that you t are, are taught or learned in an academic, uh, in an art academic environment. Mm -hmm. um, 
And um, this whole premise was to get back to the purity of, of creation. And if you watch a child create, they're not trying to follow any rules. They're not necessarily trying to make their drawing or painting look like whatever they're looking at. They're, they're cre- creating in its, in its purest form. Hmm. And that's the whole notion behind trying to draw or paint like a child. It's trying to find that, that purity of creation, that that. Um, many artists believe happens only when you're a child before you're tainted by the world. Um, so there's that to consider too. And if you think about it, if you try to create a drawing like you would have created when you were two or three years old without any preconceived notions on how a, a piece of art could or should look like, yeah. then that's a hard state for any of us to get into because we have been taught different things uh, as we grow up and we, we are taught the way art should look like or, or what it should do or, um, what its purpose is. And a child has none of that. Right. So, so art composition is a social construct. That's what it yeah, sounds like. Pretty much is, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's things that we, we things learn along learned. the way yeah. that, and, and I'm not saying that one is better. I'm not necessarily saying that drawing like a child is what you mm-hmm. should do. I'm just trying to make everybody understand where that where that these that philosophies come from. from. Yeah. yeah, Cynthia said that she thought it referenced the joy that a child has when drawing, and that's kind of what you're getting at a little bit. You know, getting back yeah, to it's the, a, it's, the purity. It's pure mark making. It's mm-hmm. pure mark making. Um, it's it's art in its purest form. All right, I've kind of been very good waiting for a minute for for some of the ink to dry up, but I don't have a minute, so I'm going to go ahead and use the kneaded eraser here and remove the graphite that we have that's still visible. And then I'm going to grab the smaller, smallest pen that I have, and then we'll, we'll add a little bit more, and then we'll get those watercolor markers in action. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to go to the point one pen now, and I'm just going to add a little bit of interest to the meat sections here to begin with. So I'm going to just a little more draw some hatching. Lines. Yeah, a little bit of hatching here. Chuck P. says, any thoughts regarding computer-based art like Photoshop or Painter? We love Photoshop. (laughs) I use Photoshop every single day. Yeah, I've used it a couple times today myself, and um, we like Procreate. Uh, Fire Alpaca, a lot of my students use Fire Alpaca. It's, It's free and available, and they draw with it, and they... They animate with it even, so um, they're working with a stylus on a on a you know on a tablet surface, not a mouse. So they're still using their their hands and their brains the same way that they would if they had paper in front of them. And so um, I don't really have a have no problem with drawing with uh, pixels instead of um, you know graphite and charcoal dust. It's all still just light and dark marks in some kind of an arrangement. And if if we do a good job, everybody knows what we're drawing in the end. Um, so I'm quickly adding these these hatching marks here, um, and I'm trying to concentrate them in the areas of shadow. You can see that there is a little bit of shadow that comes behind this uh, piece of sushi. So concentrating the marks a little bit more here, and I'm actually going to put some some hatch marks on top of the rice too in just a minute. But these marks are flowing along with the the larger lines in between. So I'm basically following the form of this meat. Marie says, wow, I already love the drawing just like that. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it could look really nice. It's just a just a pen and ink drawing. You could work it all the way up with no color. There's plenty of contrast in there, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. If I was going to finish this with pen and ink, then I would I would have a lot of value development still to go. Yeah. Um, but I have to find a place where I need to restrain myself because by adding the color, I'm also going to be adding value to it. So I'm going to be making some of the the areas darker, obviously. And uh, it's real easy to go too dark with a line and wash image if you're not careful. It's really important to find a balance between the pen and ink applications and the watercolor applications. And it's always better to err on the side of uh, not having enough material on the surface than it is to accidentally put too much. Mm. Because I can always go back over the top of the watercolor marker, watercolor applications, with additional pen and ink applications 
uh, if I want to, but I can't reverse that if I get too dark with things. And honestly, the meat I just did is getting pretty close to being too dark. All right, so I'm gonna put a little bit of indication of some, some shading that's coming across here, uh, just a little bit, and I need to think about what direction I wanna make this, because it needs to be a little bit different from this and a little bit different from this. So let's go, let's go right in the middle and just do a little bit of a diagonal. All right. I'm gonna let that fade out. David Robot asks, do you use art tablets? And uh, and kind of it kind of goes along with that. Um, Sketch Shinover says, um, as far as digital art, not me. I need the, the textile of paper and pen or pencil. I'm not into the digital stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, I do use tablets. My students use um, Wacom and Bamboo tablets when they draw in Photoshop. And we also use um, iPads now and Procreate. And that's what I like to do is draw on my iPad using Procreate. As far as the, I understand what you're saying, Sketch, about the surface, that slick surface, the glass surface does not feel like paper. But a student of mine has a surface that she's added over her iPad that actually makes the, uh, the Apple Pencil feel a lot more like you're drawing with a pencil on paper. So if you don't like, if any of you out there don't like that really slick feel of drawing um, with a stylus on glass, try to get a, try to get a piece of that um, overlay film for your tablet that makes it feel like paper. It gives it a little more friction and makes it a little more, more, you know, more uh, familiar experience. And there's also, this is, this is the stylus for my um, tablet. I have a you get the Cintiq screen. Cintiq screen. And I really honestly just use it for making animations and for <laughs> critiquing members' artworks. Yeah. Uh, I've done some drawings on it, but really, you guys know I'm more of a traditional artist. Right. Um, even though I love the digital stuff. Um, but this is the, the holder for this. And I just ironically today changed out the tip. Uh, you can see I didn't put the top back on correctly. <laughs> uh, but there are lots of tips to choose from. And you can pick the one that you like the feeling of the best. Uh, so a lot of these are repeats, obviously. Yeah. But um, the tip does feel a little bit different. And I changed the tip because the one I was using was getting worn down and was making that chalkboard sound. So that was terrible. Um, all right, mm -hmm. so we're ready with the watercolor marker applications, or we're ready for that. I'm using Windsor Newton Pro Marker watercolor markers. And you don't need much of this stuff. These markers feature two tips, one that's more like a traditional marker and one that is a brush. I'm gonna be using the brush tip okay. and these are really strong. Um, so the color is gonna be pretty intense. This color is sap green and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start um, adding this color in the areas where the value is the darkest. Okay, so I'm looking at these little pieces and there's little bit of shadows underneath them. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of color underneath these areas and it might seem like what is he doing but just be patient just okay? skipping around looking for dark shadows yeah just little bits of color there okay so we yeah. don't need to get carried away and then we can bring it over here we have a few solid areas over here and then a little bit in the lettuce too um, all right and maybe just a little around the outer edge of this piece of avocado just barely touching it and there's a little bit of green that goes underneath here, too. A little bit of contrast there. All right, uh, let's put Sketch a little bit. Sketch says um, that might work, talking about the um, that surface that you can add to a tablet, um, that they just need the feel of the drag of the pencil. I totally agree. I feel like I have a lot more control when I have some more friction uh, between my tool and the surface. So I, I would agree with that comment. And um, David Rob Robot asks, have you done any live tablet art lessons? We have, um, and uh, we actually did that as a live lesson series um, a couple of years ago for members, and some people actually got a little frustrated because uh, they felt like they needed to have a tablet in order to kind of follow along, and mm -hmm. that, really w that really wasn't the case. It was just a couple lesson series. Um, but anyway, getting back to this, you can see when I'm adding just a little bit of water to this, how this color comes alive and how we can have some areas that are uh, a little bit lighter and it brings out kind of that yellow green. Yeah. And if this is too intense, we need to make it a little bit lighter. We can just lift it up a little bit. Just a little blotting. Yeah, a little bit with the paper towel. Um, Eddie Sedgwick would like to know, are marker colors permanent? Are marker are, colors... Are those markers, those watercolor markers, are they 
permanent or they they're not permanent markers they're they're, they're like watercolor it's, yeah, so it's if like you were to color, reactivate yeah. them they might lift a little bit like watercolor Possibly. Yeah, but the thing about these watercolor markers, and I did a video about it not too long ago, is you can't let them sit without activating very long because they will turn into markers. Okay. They, if you do not, that's why I'm doing this piece So they first. may be a little more permanent than actual watercolor. Yeah, but the same thing's true for watercolor. You can always reactivate watercolor to a certain degree, to a but degree. not always. Yeah, some colors, some pigments won't reactivate much at all. Some are more staining than others. Well, gouache stays active forever, but yeah. watercolor, you know, once it's had enough time to dry and adhere to the it surface, kind of, and it penetrates the, you know, some yeah, penetrates it's, the it's paper. It's there after yeah. that. So uh, this, it, this not permanent like permanent markers, I guess, okay. is what we should say here. It's... Permanent like watercolor. Priya yeah. Shah 007 asks, would watercolor pencils do the same if we don't have the markers? Yeah, you can definitely use watercolor pencils. Uh, you're going to probably pick up a little bit of the tooth of the paper if you do use watercolor pencils. And um, the way you apply them might be a little bit different. They're, these markers are more intense, in my opinion, than watercolor markers. Oh, Eddie clarifies. He wanted to know if they're fugitive. That's clarification? Yeah. Do they run? Like oh. a fugitive. Oh, okay, I got it. <laughs> it's true. I mean, fugitive. Um, okay. Um, I'm still not. I, I, do they run? Like, like do run they run and bleed? Yeah, they they behave like uh, like watercolor. Yeah, yeah. So I and, guess they that would I guess that would make them fugitive. Yeah. Yeah, I've just never heard it referred to as yeah. Fugitive. I've, I've heard I've heard uh, and have used that word to describe. It's kind of like before. is your refrigerator a fugitive? No, not it's like that. Running. <laughs> it's, I mean, is, is, would that not be the same? You, I guess you could call somebody and ask them if their refrigerator is a fugitive. Yeah. And if they say yes, then you could still respond, then you better go catch it. Or you so. could call the refrigerator <laughs> repairman and say, yeah, I got a problem with my refrigerator. It's no longer a fugitive. <laughs> All right, so I'm putting a little bit more of an intense application in the shadowed side, which is a little closer to the... Now, the brush you were using, um, uh, Jen would like to know, was that a number two brush? Um, I, I don't know. For that brand. Hold on and I'll Did you look. say they were Grumbacher brushes? Yeah, but you, also I just want to remind everybody, too, that the brush numbers are relative to the brand. That's why I mentioned so, they're Grumbachers because the number two, um, you know, Royal Langnickel might not be the same. This is a zero brush. Okay, zero in the Grumbacher. Yeah, the, the, uh, the numbers on the brush really only apply to the brand that you're using. A zero in Grumbacher is not necessarily going to be the same. For another manufacturer. Okay. Um, Peachy3435 is helping us clarify what we mean by a fugitive. Do they fade? Oh, do they fade? No, they say they're light fast, I think. Light fast? Yeah. Okay. It's just like watercolor. Yeah. It's just in a marker. It's just watercolor in a marker. So it's still pigment in there. It's not a it's dye or an pigment ink. pigment in there. Okay. As long, like as, it's, as long as it's made of pigment, then just, it's uh, the color should stay pretty just true. Just a marker. Okay, uh, let's try this color. This is cadmium red hue, and I've got it out, so I guess we're going to try it. Um, we're going to try this for the meaty sections. So just like we did with the green sections, we're going to put just a little. We're not done with the green sections. Uh, we're almost done, but not quite. I'm just going to put a little bit of this color uh, around the edges because there's some variety in here. They're not all red. There's some white areas. And honestly, these markers could, I think that they would be a little bit better if they were a little less intense. Um, some people yeah, might, pretty powerful. might disagree with that, but I have to be super careful here. If I was using traditional watercolor, I wouldn't feel so tentative here mm -hmm. with these applications. I just throw them on there. But I'd also have to mix the colors on my palette and deal with all that. So these are really... Uh, these markers are great for creating little sketches, adding bits of color real quickly. And of course you can see some of the ink through them still. So mm -hmm. uh, that makes them kind of nice. All right, so we're gonna you can see that turns it nice and pink there. We activate it, keeping the colors intense around the outer edges. And I think both of these yeah, areas could good. deal with a 
a little bit of yellow in there. So I'm going to try to get some yellow in there before we're done. It's got six minutes. Yeah, oh, I know no. you've got six minutes. We're, we're not going to finish this in the time. That's not enough time. We've had so many great questions tonight. So we're going to go over a little bit. I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit. I thought I had plenty of time, but... David Robot says that looks like farmed salmon. That's just what I was thinking. Yeah, well, was, we were talking about that before the show went up. Are we, are we drawing wild or farmed salmon? Sketch Shinover says, Ashley, next week is steak and taters. I would love to, but we're not drawing next week. We're going we're gonna to take a look at the 10 drawings. Just a reminder, it's sort of the season wrap-up next week. We're going to look at the 10 drawings that we've made um, throughout the season and kind of critique them and talk about them a little bit, our experience. And, um, and then we'll, take a, we'll be taking a short break uh, before we return with the next season and probably a, a whole new set of, of motifs. Yeah, we'll definitely have motifs. They're growing in as we speak. Speaking of teeth, um, <laughs> this, this afternoon, my son went to the dentist, and he is missing an adult tooth. Really? What? When the x-rays revealed a space up there? Well, yeah. And um, the dentist asked my wife, is there anybody in your family who, who still has baby teeth? And she said no, but I sh told her she should have told him it was me. Yeah. And you, I, I have like chiclets. You should have said, look, I still have all my baby teeth. I have teeth. all my baby teeth. They're still there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, oh, you know what? I'm going to use a little bit of yellow ochre here. Yellow ochre. How do you like that? <laughs> Let's get some yellow ochre. Put some yellow on there. Put some yellow. Some Ellie yellow says ochre. the timer is just a recommendation. It is a recommendation. Thank you for I'm that. I'm still trying to meet it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, with this yellow, yellow ochre, I'm going to, instead of putting it on there like I did the other markers, I'm going to grab some from the tip and just add a little bit of... Wow, look at that business. ...color here. I'll let some of that fade in here. Too. Using the brush tip as the palette. Yeah, which really, you know, kind of makes... Wait a minute, wait a minute. New Force says that I'm avoiding the oil painting question. That can't be true. That can't be true. I love to oil paint. So I'm sorry, I must have missed it. It says, um, so if I see it again or we scroll back, I'll definitely read it off. <laughs> well, you can put it in again. Yeah, please put it there's in There's no again. way I can, I'm going to be able to scroll things back at this point. A little bit of bleeding happening there. Uh, Peter asks, what kind of markers are you using? I must have missed that part. These are Winsor Newton Pro Markers. Pro Marker Watercolor Markers. Winsor Newton Pro Watercolor Markers. And right now I'm just adding a little bit of color to the ricey areas. And um, we're going to add some more color to the ricey areas. Buddy lost her last baby tooth as an adult. So your teeth might still come out, Matt. <laughs> 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 they, they might. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know what we're going to do for my son, though. Um, well, you know, I was when you said that, I thought a lot of kids have to have a tooth or two pulled as they get older, you know. Maybe somebody and, will donate their teeth well, to no, my son. Well, no, maybe he'll have to have braces, but they won't need to pull any teeth. He'll actually have the right space no, no, no. for the number. He does he not have. have an adult tooth. <laughs> you mean any adult teeth? It, he does not just, have the— Just one. one of, he's missing one. one. Okay. He's missing one, yeah. Could Miss, be that they'll come in and all fit in there really well. Plenty of space. That's possible. Because, you know, my daughter just got her braces off last week because she didn't have enough space initially, and her teeth were so tight, um, you know, they were so tight against one another, she couldn't, she couldn't floss before she had braces. Well, I've gone through two sets of braces so far. Not me, but my kids. <laughs> my teeth are so small that Dennis could not find the teeth to put braces on. <laughs> he, said, he said, we don't have that size I'm of a sorry, brace. Sorry, we only service people here with adult teeth. <laughs> um, all right, now I'm going to break out a little bit of black and a little bit of blue. And, woo! Cheryl Wilson is 72 and still has a baby tooth, and it even has a crown. I'm not sure if that qualifies as a baby tooth anymore. I think it was mislabeled from the beginning. Yeah. All right, so this is Prussian blue and ivory black. And I'm going to be taking from both of these tips. So I'm going to mix them up. And as I'm mixing them up, I'm going, to, I'm going to 
incorporate some of this blue here. Oh, I like that. Uh, which is going to give us a little bit of variety in the color. What what colors are those? Prussian blue and ivory. Okay, I, I thought that was Prussian blue when you put it down. Yeah. Nice. So I'm going to grab a little bit from both of these guys. And so our black looks a little bit nat more natural, and there's a little bit more interest. And I'm also going to start putting a little bit of that in here, too, in the rice. So Hoot and it's Holler. Give us a, oh, kind of a cooler I'm gray. Sorry. Hoot and Holler has a question. Is the smooth side of cold press, smoother side of cold press watercolor paper, an okay substitute for hot press watercolor paper? It's not going to be the same. No, I guess it's different. It's going to be. Kind of between, I guess, the cold, the normal cold press side, and um, and hot press. The, sm the hot press paper has absolutely no dimples whatsoever. Yeah, the hot press paper is is smooth. The cold press watercolor paper is not smooth. It still has the uh, even, even on the back. Even it's on the smooth. back. Yeah. It it it's how they are. It's how the papers are manufactured that gives it that that tooth. Okay, now as I'm adding these darker areas, mm -hmm. um, ideally I'm kind of creating some other shapes of rice to kind of insinuate that mm -hmm. there's more rice in there, but uh, that's working in some areas and not so much in some others. Priya says, Matt sushi looks way more appealing than the actual sushi. <laughs> I'd eat that. Great job, Matt. I wonder if you eat sushi or not. And I spilled <laughs> some black. I opened up the black pen and it just like... Went everywhere on me. Again, that's something that will not happen if you are using watercolor um, <laughs> instead of watercolor markers. But we're using watercolor markers here. All right. Shangha Amar says, how do you prevent the bleeding of black pen marks when you put the water and mixing with light colors. Um, and it sounds like, I think Buddy's right. I think you may have a pen that is does that is not um, permanent. It doesn't have archival ink or pigment in there. That's possible. Yeah, I it's got to be waterproof. Yeah. Water, yeah. got to be waterproof ink. There's some pens that are, that are office supply pens, liquid flare pens that I like to draw with because they're available all the time, but they're also not waterproof. I've run into the same problem with those. So it's a good idea to test the pens you're using um, just to make sure you're going to be able to watercolor over them before you spend a long time making a drawing with the intention of adding watercolor over it. Well, who doesn't like a pen that doesn't have some flair? Liquid yeah, I know. Flare. I don't mind a little flair coming off of my pen lines. It added a little bit of, of uh, smoky mystery. Everybody likes Ric Flair. Why wouldn't they like liquid flair? I'm holding back with everything I've got to not, you know, do the Ric Flair woo. woo. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. We love Ric Flair in this we're, part of the country. We're from Ric Flairville. Yeah, um, from, that's right. We live in Ric Flairville. David Robot says, time's up. Please keep going. Yeah, I'm going to keep going yeah, here. Forget we're, that timer. We're almost, forget that timer. We're almost to a point where we could call it done, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, so um, add a little bit more color there. So a little bit more of that blue. I really want that blue to be a little bit stronger, but. That's okay. We still need to go back and enhance the lines. Pump it up a little bit in the lines. Yeah, Get we need to add a little bit in more there. yellow in there, too. So we... Make these shadows feel a little cooler. And this is a pretty standard illustration technique, I guess, pen and watercolor together. It's pretty uh, yeah, popular. Yeah, line and wash is super popular yeah, right now. Yeah, line and wash. Super popular. Now, I'm rotating these these pins around because what happens with the lid off is the watercolor material leaks to the bottom. Mm -hmm. so, you can, so you can see the top of the pin is a little bit lighter. I don't know if you can see that. You probably can't see it. It's a little bit lighter. No, you can't see it at all. But no. you got to keep rotating them around. So you're getting some fresh, some fresh stuff on there. Ooh, that's too strong. Move that around a little bit. And then lift that up. There we go. It's a little bit better. All right. Let's add a little bit of yellow and a little bit more black. Let me just add a little bit more black to the sushi pieces. Not too much, but just a little bit.
Edie says, beautiful drawing. And Dorothy says, I feel like I live in a bubble. Who is Ric Flair? <laughs> <laughs> the bubble you live in is a good one. Yeah, it's so, probably a good one. You're not in a bad place. Yeah, you're not in a bad bubble. Rick Ric Flair is a professional wrestler. We're talking about fake TV wrestling <laughs> from the 70s and 80s. And Matt and I grew up watching him on Saturday mornings. Him and the Four Horsemen, that's what yeah. they called themselves. <laughs> it's just complete, complete uh, ridiculousness. All right, let's add a little bit of yellow to uh, some of the But he doesn't live very far from us and occasionally makes the news. Yeah, he's... even in his uh, even, you know, in his retirement for basically professional wrestling style antics out in public. I'm pretty sure he <laughs> made the news um, cuz he gave a pep talk to the Denver Broncos before they went out to play the Panthers for the Super Bowl. Oh my gosh. And that was considered treason around here. <laughs> That was straight. I can't treason. believe he did that. I can't believe he did that either. But uh, a lot of people didn't. I, I might have my stories mixed up, but yeah, that, that could I'm be pretty a sure. Pretty sure that's what happened. All right, so you can see I put a little bit of yellow in there. Maybe a little bit too intense with the yellow there, but one South Paul two says the blue brings the sheen of the seaweed out. Yeah, I like yeah, that. It's kind of an unexpected in there. to use. Uh, blue there, it might seem kind of a strange decision, but I kind of actually want more blue, and especially on this last guy over here. And a little bit more. New Force asks, can Matt do an a la prima oil painting for our live lesson? Yeah, we could probably do that. We could probably do that. 45 minutes is plenty of time to make an oil sketch. Are you asking for that now or not right now? Yeah, we're we're at the end of this one, but we might yeah, we, could, I, we could work in a forty-five minute oil painting in the next season. <laughs> I mean, they're not that big, like five three by I mean, like a six by eight something like that. I could bust that out. All right, uh, now now is the time to pull out the hair dryer and dry all this up so we can make our final pen and ink applications, but. I don't have a hair dryer, so uh, I'm going to make these. I'm try my best to make these final applications. The last thing we need to do is we need to make uh, the outer contours of the sushi a little bit stronger. We're losing that line, and that's why I'm going to make this a little bit thicker and add a little bit of irregularity to it as well. So I've gone back to the uh, 0.5 in here and. Obviously, I'm going very quick here. The paint is still wet, or the marker markers are still wet. This is really, this is really just like the same kind of deal as with the watercolor pencils. So, you know, once you've activated watercolor pencils, you're basically dealing with watercolor, and that's basically what we're dealing with here. Even though these are watercolor markers. So this area where I'm drawing these contour lines is still a little wet, which is not ideal. All right, I like that extra variable line quality you're putting in there. It's a nice touch. Yeah, it makes, a, it makes a big difference. Thanks for that. But yeah, it, does it does make a big difference. Um, and that's one way that you can quickly and easily improve your pen and ink drawings um, is just making sure that you have enough variety in the line. Variety is one of the principles of art. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people forget about variety, but uh, it's especially important when you're dealing with any type of medium that has, um, it's going to be repetitive. I mean, you can imagine a painting, if you use the same brush with the same length and same width of brush stroke throughout the entire painting. Uh, it might actually be kind of cool now that I'm thinking about it, but um, you need a little bit of variety in there. Yeah, variety and adds interest. You need variety in here, too. Imagine if you if sushi was your favorite food and um, for the rest of your life you had to eat sushi for every meal. It wouldn't be your favorite food much longer, right? Because you get right. tired of it. All right, that looks great. Um, thanks. Very nice. And one last little bit down here. There we go. 
All right. Um, so this right. one is complete. Boom. Now time's up. Yeah, now's time. Now, now time's, time's up. up. You just, the timer just went off. So just to kind of recap real quick, uh, we drew things out really quickly with an, a 2H pencil. Then we went over the lines with ink, making sure we kind of started with the thicker pens first and worked our way back a little bit. Um, and we didn't add a whole lot of shading here with the pen and ink because you saw when we added the watercolor, the values got darker anyway. Mm -hmm. And this one honestly is on the verge of getting too dark. So um, it's real easy to get too dark with a pen and ink drawing if you're going to apply watercolor over the top. So you have to be careful with that. Um, then we just apply the watercolor markers just minimally and then activated them. And that's that's enough uh, for this. So. Um, these markers are really, really strong, really, really intense, but they're great for sketching really quick and creating little illustrative images like this. I really would have liked to put a little bit more texture in the watercolor applications to make it look a little bit more like rice, uh, but it's working, so. Um. Yeah, it's nice, nice illustration, nice sketch. Priya says, good job, Matt. Thanks for making us all hungry now. And Julie says, that separ separated the more depth. We're talking about those heavy, the heavier oh, yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm definitely hungry. Remember, I had a protein bar. And it's gone. For it's gone. It's already worked its way through my system. <laughs> I, I have no nourishment in my body right now. Um, all right, uh, question here, Dana says, if we attempt to draw every single piece of rice, would it be overdone? Possibly. I, I'm kind of borderline too many pieces of rice here. If I was doing a pen and ink drawing, um, if you look at the photo reference, uh, you can't make out the edges of every piece of rice. That's true. They really, really mush together into larger shapes and places. Yeah, so when you draw it, you should kind of simplify it into a way that, that mimics the way that you're seeing it. In fact, it. you might could have done the rice with just the watercolor, possibly. Absolutely, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's why I kind of said I maybe went too far on the pieces of rice uh, here. So... A uh, little bit is enough to accentuate or uh, insinuate uh, things. And I really probably would have preferred to put more of the rice pieces more in the shadowed areas. I kind of spaced them out. Uh, I said I was going to put them in the, <laughs> in the shadowed areas, and then I just put them everywhere. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so you can kind of back off of it a little bit, uh, probably a little bit more so than I did. But, yeah, if you drew every piece of rice, there would be too much ink on the paper. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, well, that's it. All right, very good. I think that's the last capital question. All right. All right, guys, thanks for sticking around for the last hour plus. If you did, I hope you enjoyed it. We are getting close to going live on the next area. That's the, the virtualinstructor.com. Remember, if you're a member, you can join us over there. We're going into part six. Six? I think so. I think it's six. Six or seven. Uh, I think it's six. <laughs> yeah, I think it is six. Where I'm, I'm drawing, doing something completely different, working with pastels, and we're doing a landscape uh, with birch trees. You do have to be a member to uh, watch that, but you can start your trial right now, and you can join us in just a few minutes. Uh, there's also that link to free course videos and eBooks. Check that out below as well in the description. Uh, Ashley, got anything else for? Um, I don't have anything to add. I just uh, hope that you'll join us next week while we recap the 10 drawings that we made and uh, continue to um, have great conversations and answer any questions that you might have. So otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you here in seven days. Excellent. And one last question. It looks like uh, Edie maybe asked That's right, Edie. what kind of market is there for marker drawings as compared to other media. Market drawings uh, or marker drawings are typically going to be for uh, illustrations, or potentially for concept drawings. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not gonna find a lot of marker drawings in like a gallery no. or definitely not a museum. Uh, so it's really gonna be more for illustrative purposes. And since there's so many digital avenues for creating illustrations today, a marker drawing might actually be where you start with a sketch and then you bring it into a digital program to put the fine tuning on it. Um, so if you want uh, a little bit of reality there, that's probably the reality. Um, <laughs> Um, a watercolor marker drawing might get a little bit more street cred, if you will, because it is a little bit more like the traditional medium of watercolor. But markers have always kind of been considered more of a concept type of art making medium. Um, 
unfortunately, that's just the way it is. I'm not trying to. Now, the way you use markers sometimes underneath your colored pencils is a little bit different. That is different. Yeah. It's an underpainting. It doesn't even look like a quote marker drawing. It's just right. part of your process. Right. Right. If you're if you're using it as an underpainting painting or an underlayment to a final medium like colored pencils, like Ashley was talking about. Uh, then it's going to have a little bit more of a heavier weight associated with it as being considered more of a finished piece of artwork. But even still, colored pencils are still just barely out of that that realm of illustration and conceptual art. Mm -hmm. uh, colored pencils definitely get a little bit more respect than markers do. But uh, markers just don't get the respect they deserve because markers aren't easy to use. Uh, they're kind of difficult to use and they're kind of similar to watercolor too in mm -hmm. the difficulty level. But anyway, all right, that's enough because we're going to have to... Yeah, we're gonna have to we got to get hustle. ready for the next show. All right, guys, thanks again. Have a wonderful week. Remember next week uh, when we do this live, we're going to be reviewing all the drawings that we did this season and do, give them a quick critique. And last time we did that last season, it was really popular and it was mm -hmm. really a lot of fun to go through those drawings. We're going to have to go quick because we're only going to have an hour, but uh, we'll be able to get through all of them. I feel confident, and I hope that we see you then. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off of Getting Sketchy and get ready for our live lesson. Good night, everybody. <laughs>